Hi guys, I've made a short video yesterday, but I want to talk in deep now about the affidavit, the release of unsealing of the affidavit of the quadruple murders in Idaho on the November 13th, 2022. I'm going to get straight to the point and I'm going to say this. How many individuals have been convicted for uh, 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 especially because they didn't call 911 after they found someone deceased, their loved ones, and they were not believed in court because um, they were asked, why didn't you call 911, right? How many people we have sitting behind bars that could be innocent and they were convicted based on specifically because they didn't call 911 or they call 911 after 20 minutes, after 30 minutes, because they called the father, they called the girlfriend, they called the boyfriend, they called the auntie, they called the nanny before they call 911, right? So, we know that happens. In this particular case, this is crazy and we're talking about and I'm not. I'm not going to go into the affidavit because I'm sure most of you now have by now have uh, have read or heard or or have some kind of some form of um, knowledge of the affidavit in details or partially, especially the uh, subject I'm talking about the um, not calling the nine one one. When you find yourself in a situation like this, and you're faced with a murderer, you're looking at someone who's dressed all in black, covered his face, his nose is clearly masked up, yeah? I mean, come on, man, you're looking at your death. Are you just going to lock yourself in and that's it? And do nothing about it? And I really don't care how drunk you are and whatever you, you, your, your state is in, you are going to call 911. You are going to, after you left, you're going to scream and shout, is everyone all right? Oh my God, what's going on? Everyone come out of the rooms. I've just seen someone all dressed in black. No, you're not just you're going to lock the door and that's it. doesn't end there. I'm sorry, but it doesn't end there. To me. To me, if it doesn't make sense, it didn't happen. Simple as that. Now I'm going to talk about how many cases we have where, and this is a common, this is a common, uh, because you know we, we in movies and from from movies from everything we all believe that someone who's disguising themselves, you know, the man in black with the dark black mask showing only his eyes. This is a common thing, right? This is a movie. This is a Hollywood thing, okay? So, how many cases we've had uh, when murders have happened and, and the spouse is involved and, and this spouse comes and say, or any other family member or friend, and immediately they had a witness. Uh, they were they were they were bound with rope, and they were, and these men were all wearing black masks and covered their faces. All they can see their eyes, because you know what? For someone who's committed a murder, it's easier to give. Uh, to to introduce to plant in someone else was who committed a murder and this someone else was wearing all black it was all disguised couldn't see anything I really can't they give no description right so all you have to do is just give a little bit of rough uh, height and that's it right so yeah it was all dressed in black I I didn't see anything um. I couldn't see anything. I don't know what it looks like, but yeah, he was about this tall, and yeah, he was of a slim build, or he was of a fat build, or he was of a this build. So, this type of uh, witnessing is is uh, common for someone who's committed a murder or crime of any uh, type, like high profile, especially, right? And I've not. 
attacking anyone here. I'm not saying specifically her, him or her or whoever. What I'm saying is this disclosure of the affidavit has, has, has raised more questions and eyebrows than, than prior to releasing the affidavit. And there is loads in that affidavit that is actually putting more questions than answers to who committed this murder. This is bizarre. This is unexplained. This has to be explained. This has to make some sense to all of us. And I believe, I believe that they have got a duty towards the public to come out and explain this bizarre, weird, no 911 call for nine hours. We need this information. And you know what? I don't care if there's a gag order. I don't care of any of law or anything. This is a mess. They messed it up in the initial report, in the initial uh, uh, autopsy report, coroner interview, and the press conference. It was stated clearly that it's believed the victims were ambushed in their sleep, and some had defense, possibly have defensive wounds. Two of surviving maids were on the first. Floor, right? And we believe this was targeted. So now we need answers. We need someone to come out and speak and explain this affidavit. This is all a bull. You know, to me, this is absurd. Now they're talking, mainly they're talking about the white hand launcher and the records of his uh, phone number uh, and the cell tower records matching up the, the, the moving of the white launcher on that particular night or any other time that a launcher was near there. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I can kind of see now why Brian Kochberg, and I'm not saying he's innocent, I'm not saying he's guilty. Prior to the affidavit, I was over 100% sure they've got the right person, they know what they're doing. Now, mm, I don't think so. Now, Brian Kochberg can have a simple, innocent explanation to all these movements of his car, turning off his phone, or being near the area, and why his cell phone was pink. Now, mind you, his cell phone pinged near the 112 to King Road on 12 occasions prior to this, but this is going back since June, right? And this is the time Brian moved into Washington area, Washington State University. This is exactly when he actually came within the Washington area. This is the time when he obtained his phone number. This is the time when he's registered his phone number. So the very first ping is starting in June, right? And throughout June, July, August, September, October, November. This wasn't a ping of 13 times or 12 times, including the uh, 13th of November, 13 times, let's say. I'm not sure if it was 12 or 13 times. This wasn't like this was pinged in a month prior to the murders. These pings on his phone, pinging in that area, I from. Now, who is to say that he didn't have a friend, associate, a girlfriend, or someone he was dating, or, you know, someone uh, clubbing, or vegan restaurant he was going to, or, you know, socializing, or whatever his reason was. Yeah, who's to say he wasn't driving past, you know, or he didn't have a friend near the house? This could be a total innocent explanation why his car was being, uh, his phone was being, uh, why his car was in the area, especially, you know, even on the night of the murders. This is so bizarre. This is what I found this, this is why I found this so bizarre. 
That white car originally was seen in the area outside the house in this skin road and all, going in and out, turning around and everything, right? And t this was to supposedly uh, rule that as, as being a Hyundai Elantra, right? White Hyundai Elantra, right? But they're not saying it was definitely Brian, did I? Even if he was Brian, yeah, could be that he was just visiting someone he knows there. Maybe he just knows someone who lives there, right? Yes, they have got much. They have got much of the cell phone pinging, where the car was moving. Like I said previously, but this doesn't make him a murderer. This doesn't put him on the on on the scene and murdering these four innocent students. Now, they don't talk much about the knife, knife shift they found and they only mention that his DNA was matched through his father, that 99% that this was uh, the father of the perpetrator because they obtained DNA from the, the trash of his parents' house and his father's DNA was compared to the DNA of the knife shift, uh, but fastening. I believe on the inner side there was a little DNA found there and that puts him at the scene. Whoa, 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 hang on a minute. This type of knife, and as the detective was explaining in the he's, he's describing that he took a glance and he saw, sometimes then he noticed a tanned knife shave just on the side beside Maddie's body on her right side. He did not describe there was blood or there was not blood on the night shift. He did not mention that. He said later on forensics have confirmed there was a DNA of a male that was found on the baton fastening and later on they confirmed they, they compared that to, to be a possible match with Brian because his father was matching uh ninety so percent of the DNA. Yeah, that could be uh Brian Kocherberger's knife shift. Could be. But doesn't mean he committed the murders. It could mean that he was set up. It could mean someone planted it there. This leaves a lot of room for the defense to to put that theory forward, you know? And they might even have proof that yeah, this was his knife but this is how that might have gotten there. Do you know what? With a knife shift like that for a canine bar, this particular knife sh knife shifts have got a loop that is designed to be worn and on the, on a belt. This is a belt loop. This is something that you can secure on your belt and you can wear. And come on, guys. They really expect me to believe, I don't know about you, but I do not believe this murderer, especially if he planned murders, yeah, it wasn't like abduction or anything else. Are you going to believe that he did not have secured, he didn't have the knife shift secured on, on the belt? And are you going to believe that he happened to leave the knife shift, according to the affidavit, uh, uh, Maddie and, and Kaylee were are very likely killed last. So you telling me you're gonna believe that the murderer left the night shift behind her? Really? I don't think so. This is bizarre, this is a nonsense, this is absurd. All this witness uh that I heard someone said this, it was a male, okay, I'm going to help you. Um then I see someone's here and then she looks out the window and all this is just not making sense. This is a whole lot of a palaver and a bizarre and to be honest with you, if I was sat in a jury hearing this, I'll say no, thank you very much. I can't give no opinion on this. And to me, it now speaks volume because now I see why Brian Kochberger, Kochberger but could be innocent and it's probably why he stay is eager to be exonerated because you know he deep down knows why his car was there 
in he properly understands and figured out why the police think you know in the end of the day who's to say that nobody else had hold of um keys from his car who's to say while he was asleep nobody else took his car and committed this murder and put it back we don't know if he had a roommate yeah the phone number pinged as well so it's very likely that brian was um who was driving the lunch but it doesn't mean he's the one who committed the murders it doesn't mean that at all and in the affidavit does not say that it was definitely his car that was seen outside King Road at that particular time, just before the murders. And it doesn't confirm that at all. They cannot say who was driving it. They've got no evidence of who was driving it. They've got no evidence that was the, the actual car. And his phone number is not pinging anywhere near that residence on the night of the murder, on the time, at the time they were murdered. That's it. This could be, you know, as much as we don't like it, that, you know, Brian Kochberger could have an innocent explanation to why his car was moving that way there and why his car was there and all the... Uh, pings. He could have an uh, innocent explanation to this. In the end of the day, he was an individual, a uh, single man, and he had a life, you know. He wasn't just going to the uni and back in his apartment. He was going shopping, he was doing things, he was socialising. He's not bound to stay in Washington area. It's very close. He could have had, like I said, a girlfriend, date, friend, whatever, whatever, you know. Could have had a favourite vegan shop that he went to shop with and, you know. However, this case, this affidavit is puzzling. This affidavit is uh, is crazy. It's just crazy. It doesn't really pin Brian Koberger to the murders. It does not pin him in any way, shape or form to say he killed Zana, he killed Ethan, he killed Kelly. He killed Maddie. His defense team is winning this already. They cannot, the prosecutor cannot stand there and explain how he killed Zana, how he killed Ethan, how he killed it. That was him. If there's no single DNA, connect him to the victims, to the actual murder. Forget it. And so far, that's not enough for Dave. And if they didn't disclose it and they've got it, I doubt that is the case. I really doubt. I think this is what they had and out of excitement. That's why they wrote 16 pages to be more convincing because they deep down knew they've got uh, circumstantial evidence and this DNA on the fast battening, uh, the uh, fastening of the knife ship could be planted. They know that. They know this is not no way, shape or form a strong evidence to say he committed murders. That DNA could have got on that night shift for many reasons, you know. Many reasons why that the, his DNA was there. Maybe at one point when he was on sale, the knife, he touched it. He was interested in knives. He was in somewhere in the shop. He touched it and somehow his DNA remained there. you surprised how many DNAs have been recovered through brand new items that... Uh, scientists have investigated, they've bought brand new things and they've swapped to see what DNA they're going to find, if they're going to find any. And yes, they found DNA of people who work there, people who in the production, people who pack things, people who transported, you know, it, it's un- not uncommon. So his DNA being on a knife ship proves absolutely nothing. I'm going to stop talking now and I've got food to get on with to finish my cooking and um, yeah let's hear what Brian's got to say I think this is now 50-50 you know even even 70-50 in favour of Brian Kochberger and his defence team that's what my belief is until they come out until they come out and explain this palaver and, and nonsense in the affidavit about the 911 call and why the why the supposed um, witness didn't do anything about it because do you know what 
you know, how many people have been convicted of not calling 911 and that person, uh, 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 an expert said that person's life could have been saved if 911 was called within the next 20 or 30 minutes or to an hour. So why didn't she call 911? Who is to say that the victims couldn't have been saved within if she called 911? Who is to say that? Eh? Who is to say that? So how is others behind bars convicted of manslaughter and that is their fault and they're guilty? How is she not guilty for not calling 911 and trying to save their lives? And I don't care if she was drunk, right? I'm gonna end it here.